and we will uh, have a very, what I hope is going to be a very dynamic exchange with the co-chairs of the session, of, of, the, of the whole meeting, and with all of you. Um, we have, uh, starting to my extreme uh, right and your extreme left, is James Turley. He's the chairman and CEO of Ernst and, and Young. He's a co-chair of the World Economic Forum on Latin America this year, as they are his colleagues. Jorge Londoño Saldarriaga, next to him, is the C president and CEO of Bank Colombia, one of the most uh, important uh, successful bankers, I should say, in Latin America. Uh, next to him, uh, Luis Fernando Furlan, uh, an old friend of the World Economic Forum, former minister, uh, successful minister in the government of Brazil, uh, and, 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 a, and, a, and a leader. He, uh, he is now the co-chair of the board of directors of BRF Brazil Foods uh, in Brazil. And uh, to my right and to your uh, left, I have Luis Fernando Alarcón Mantilla, who is the chairman and CEO of Grupo Empresarial ISA. Uh, we are going to have uh, uh, them start the conversation with their own interpretations and their own gut feelings and sentiments and central messages about uh, this meeting. But before doing that, this year we have a very interesting innovation. The World Economic Forum has worked with other organization, uh, organizations in, in identifying uh, what they call change makers, young change makers. These are young leaders uh, from throughout Latin America uh, that are now between 18 and 22 years old that have distinguished themselves for their leadership and their innovative uh, capabilities and uh, ways of understanding uh, what, what they want uh, from the world around them. They have been undergoing an exercise where they have been, uh, these are people, youngsters, that are from 18 to 22 years old in 10 years, they're going to be 28 to 32 years old. And so the question that uh, they, they, they have been asked is, what is it that our generation should do in the next decade before they get to that age? And they said that it, we either do it or they're going to do it uh, uh, themselves. So we are going to give them each a very 60 seconds to each one of them to tell us what, what do they expect from us as a generation and what is their most uh, uh, cherished uh, project. Uh, let me start with uh, Diego Rivero from Brazil, 22, year old, 22 years old. Diego, they're all seated right there. Well, everyone, thank you very much for the opportunity. Well, as a global change maker and as well as the next generation of young leaders that is taking over right now, uh, I, uh, I, have the, I have to carry out the duty to provide you my pitch. So basically my idea for the leaders to apply in the next 10 years is related to integration and cooperation. Uh, in the last few years we have seen a lot of natural disasters occurring to countries like Chile, like Haiti. And for sure the nations rushed to provide financial aid, humanitarian help, but uh, uh, what, do we, what do we have to do to manage to get it from these situations of disasters? More than actions, add actions, help actions. I'll give you an example of what is done in Brazil, uh, a principle that is spread in Brazil. Uh, the Brazilian aid policies are very a good example of how an external policy might be used strategically as a tool for empowering economic empowering society and empowering regional integration, help rebuilding nations and providing recognition for the, for, for the region. So my pitch would be uh, 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 to use and to apply for the nation in, in the region. This culture or helping each other. This is something that will surely help the nations to succeed together. Uh, uh, the nations doesn't, don't, stand, don't have to be trading partners to seek for a funding or a, a budget, but I think there's no reason why this should not be a step towards the future as a cooperation. So this will sure bring us the prosperity we are talking about right now. Thank you very much, uh, Diego. Uh, David Riveros Garcia from Paraguay, he's 19 years old. Hello, everyone. 
I want to talk about this region, Latin America. We live in a region that is constantly being divided by ideologies and by new proposals of international cooperation. But I think we need to foster binational cooperation as the basis of a new integrational model. For instance, Paraguay and Brazil came together to build Itaipu Binacional, the hydroelectric power plant dam. Nowadays, Itaipu is the most powerful in the world in terms of energy production. And talking about Itaipu, we are not talking only about a conscious way of using natural resources to produce clean energy. We're talking about intergovernmental cooperation that strengthens the bonds of trust. We're talking about social responsibility, corporate responsibility. And this, of course, leads to environmental protection, education, healthcare improvement, technological development, and poverty relief. And this is obviously translated into progress and a better economical situation for our region. So I call you, the global leaders, to replicate this example so we can do a, a concrete step toward a final, finally united Latin America. Thank you very much, David. Irma Leticia Oseguera Ochoa from Mexico. She's 18. Good afternoon. Well, we have been struggling a problem with the application of a solution for the big problem that is education. We all know that even though the students are increasing in Latin America, we still rank in very low levels in international comparisons. So I think civic, civil, public, and private sectors should work together and unify the forces for education so that we can have development and also, sorry, and also assure the continuity of all the, the policies and the distribution of the resources. Nowadays, the use of mobile phones, internet, and social media are like really common in Latin America. And uh, we can, but we, the use of this technology hasn't been that study in the sector of education. So my proposal is that nowadays, education in Latin America should become Latin American education, sorry, education in Latin America should become 2.0. Thank you. Thank you, Irma Leticia. From Colombia with 20 years, Laura Paola Sarta. Hello, everyone. First, um, I'd like to talk about the environmental and the geographic diversity we have in Latin America. You have probably heard a lot about this in these past few days, but I want to stress this because I think that ecotourism should be implemented in the whole region. Why? Because ecotourism is a very interesting economic alternative for Latin American countries because of their diversity. Ecotourism allows us to, one, preserve our natural resources, two, promote uh, well-being in our local communities, promote development in the rural areas, but we're also getting an economic profit out of it. Mexico and Costa Rica are already working on this, and they've become really, really good at it. And Colombia is working towards that as well. But I think other Latin American countries that have this diversity should also take these examples into account. That being said, um, I think uh, I would like to bring to the table the question of the social and economic development through a creative industries. Why this? Because despite the growing focus of the creative industries as a specialized field in developed countries, Latin America has become a very important region studying this field as a potential economic growth. And I think uh, the creative industries are not only a way of fostering cultural diversity in an enriching way, instead of uh, fostering cultural mm, troubles amongst our region that have become more and more common nowadays, but they can also broaden our perspective 
in the things that we export to the world and they can help our economy as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. And the final change maker from, comes from Chile. She is 18, Maria Jesus Sata Delgado. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, okay, I would like to start saying um, that I believe that we are all concerned on how solving Latin American social issues. And we all know that political leaders can apply um, the latest, um, latest social policies as a root of the problem. I think that we have been doing this, but in order to improve, I would like to tell you an example that has been done in my country, in Chile. An organization called Rodelillo, which has been supporting families in difficult conditions, that um, empowering them to value their stories, empowering them to value their capabilities and to make them feel they have opportunities. And this year, uh, nowadays, even though they've been working for 23 years, uh, they, uh, the first generation they work with, those children they work with are mostly professionals. And I feel that this is really important. I work in this, in this uh, type of community action work in Medellin. I live here in Colombia. And I work with ex-combatants and their families. And I know how important it is for them to make them feel they've got opportunities after these difficulties. So what I would like to say to all of you is, as leaders, to focus also and have a great imp impact or importance in what a social community projects are. And yes, and help us in that. Thank you. So you see, there is an endless uh, uh, source of uh, creativity, innovation, and ideas. You have a very hard, difficult act to follow. Uh, this is a very, very stimulating set of ideas. Thank you very much to the change maker. Thank you also to Professor George Markovic, uh, uh, who has uh, helped us uh, with this. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Markovic. Uh, the co-chairs, let's start with your own uh, summary uh, of uh, important ideas to take home. Would you like to start? I'd be delighted to start, uh, but I'm not sure I'd really be delighted because these were five very difficult acts to follow. They have some enormously uh, intelligent and, and thoughtful ideas, both from the head and from the heart. And so um, I think this has been an outstanding gathering of the World Economic Forum. I think we've talked about a lot of different issues. Um, and the intersection of economic issues and social policy issues and governmental issues. Uh, you know, the theme being where we see uh, this region in the next 10 years. Let me just preface my remarks by saying that uh, Ernst & Young has operations in 140 countries around the world. I have the luxury of uh, living in both New York and London but the sort of opposite luxury of spending 75% of my nights in neither of those two cities. And so I'm all around the world, and what I hear continuously from the business community is just how positively they view Latin America in general. They talk mostly and first about Brazil. They talk second about Colombia, but they talk about the region overall. So when I look at the next 10 years, I see substantially continuing and, in fact, increasing prosperity. We're in the midst of a V-shaped recovery right now. I think that prosperity will continue across this region. When I look 10 years on, I think it's essential, and a couple of the, uh, the change makers commented on this, that there be more integration among the countries that make up Latin America. I think that there is enormous power and one of the panels that I had the pleasure of being on this week talked about the power of nearly common language throughout the region and that there were a lot of questions around could there be even more commonality to come in the next decade around perhaps common currencies, perhaps uh, common travel documentation and visa requirements, perhaps even uh, integration, mergers potentially of the exchanges, 
uh, and the bourses across this region to really make doing business here even uh, easier. Um, I think we're going to see continuing and even strengthening political stability in the region. I think that when you compare the region today to what it looked like 10 years ago, I think there is just enormous progress that has been made, and I would hope and expect that to continue to, uh, to be the case. Um, and I think when you look at the trade issue, uh, you're going to see a much more balanced trade portfolio from Latin America. Uh, no question there's increasing ties between this region and the East, the Middle East, India, China, the Middle East, and I think that is only going to continue. My guess is 10 years from now we'll have a very balanced trade portfolio between this region and the East, right alongside of this region in North America. My guess is that the relative level of trade between here and Europe will tend to decline. I do think there are risks to this optimistic uh, view, uh, but I'll let, leave it to others. I'll come back and talk about the risks later. Thank you very much. Jorge. Um, certainly there are many, many things that uh, are in the positive side. Um, I've never been in a forum uh, of investors and business people in which I can perceive such a positive attitude towards uh, Latin America and particularly towards Colombia. Uh, is, uh, as I was expressing just before this conference to a friend, the time that I found easier to sell Colombia. Uh, people are realizing the potentialities of the, of the economy and the potentialities of the uh, uh, current circumstances that we are living in the world. Uh, the possibilities of the emerging markets after we have become uh, a 50-50 world uh, are enormous. And uh, I think that in a rightly moment, the world started to change a little bit the denomination of the different areas of the world. We don't talk now about developed and undeveloped economies or pro uh, economies in the process of developing. Uh, now we call about mature economies that look more like uh, old and uh, slow-moving uh, subjects and emerging markets, which are like uh, where the dynamics is. And certainly that is something that is very clearly in the perception of uh, most of the people that I have uh, here in presentation that are, uh, I have the opportunity to talk to. Latin America has successfully weathered this crisis, and there is a lot of things that are behind that fact. Uh, not only that uh, the economies were in a particularly good moment, but certainly that the economies and the business were well managed. Uh, this success in coming uh, out of the crisis shows that we had good central banks, we had good economic policies, certainly there is ample room for, for improving and for uh, um, doing, correcting things that uh, we have in trouble at the moment, but we didn't have the particular circumstances that led to the crisis of the mature economies of this world. We were affected by that, but we were affected in a different way. Our countries suffer because the world markets uh, uh, were faced with that sudden decline, and uh, Colombia was part of it, and the rest of Latin America was part of it, and it showed in the prices of some of our export products, and it showed in the volume of our products to those markets. But we were very quickly developed, because, very quickly recovered, because uh, investors and companies didn't have a big loss in the value of their assets. Therefore, the potentiality for recovering was there, and very quickly the prices of our investments came up, and the plans of the companies for expansion and for doing new business were never stopped, were not suspended, and the, con and the countries and the region recovered the pace very quickly. Uh, should I talk now about the challenges, or should I we, leave We'll it? get back to that. Okay. We'll have another round. So that's it, then. Thank you, Jorge. Luis Fernando. Yes, one of the major perceptions of this uh, meeting is the change of the mood compared to last year. So 
I see people talking about the future, talking about the outcome, elections in Chile, elections in, in this country, elections in Brazil, and investors not worried about the outcome of the elections because the candidates are, in general, in good conditions. And the perception also that uh, these, the countries of this region that used to be a problem and nowadays are helping the solutions because of their internal markets, because the improvements of the macroeconomy, because improvements of democracy. Even though there are some criticism about uh, these and that uh, uh, president or country, but I see that as uh, normal. I was wondering that uh, when uh, a sports player become well recognized and with a lot of medals, and then, well, swimmers or golf players or football players, and then when they commit something that unexpected, then that generates a uh, a lot of criticism, not recognizing what is the track record of that athlete, of that politician, of that businessman. So maybe the expectations as the success of countries of the region like Colombia and Brazil are generating to people that that guy should be perfect. He cannot make any mistake. And all of us make mistakes. And my grandfather used to say that the cemetery is plenty of people that you could not replace. But at the end, the young guys that uh, are there, they will be replacing us probably much better than we are doing today. So probably much sooner, too. You can never tell. <laughs> yeah. Latin America is an expression that I, I never agreed because there is not a Latin Europe. You have a lot of countries in Europe that could be Latin Europe, including Romania. And nobody says that, uh, even that uh, the, the language Latina was created in Rome, but there is not, a, and the Roman dominated the Europe and a large part of Asia and Africa. So Latin America is a group of countries that are different. They have something in common. Maybe the language that Portugal can be understood all over Latin America. But they are different. The Indians of Brazil are different than the Indians of Peru. They, and, and so on. You could see yesterday evening the show, beautiful show, the African experience, the African influence in the yesterday shows. It's similar to Bahia or many other parts of Latin America. And that's nothing to do with Rome, with Latin. This African origin uh, dancing and, and music. So we have a lot of endemic disease. And everybody likes to, sh to say that we have problems with education, bureaucracy, corruption, infrastructure, protectionism, environment. And, but we should recognize that step by step, we are moving ahead. Some countries are lagging behind. That's why maybe after this world crisis, countries of Latin America appeared as part of the solution and not part of the problem. The banking system here in Colombia, in Brazil, and many, in Chile, in other countries, are healthy, no problem at all, no money from the government. So no problem with IMF. They are helping the, the pigs, created a new word that is not linked to pork meat, it's, as you know. So at the end, I'm happy that in this closing session, we're, we are talking about the outcome. We are talking about the future. We are talking about a lot of work to do, but celebrating that we have moved from last year to this year, 
and we'll keep moving like Johnny Walker. Keep walking, keep moving. <laughs> Thank you, Luis Fernando. Um, another Luis Fernando Alarcón. Bueno, muchas gracias, Moisés. Para aprovechar mejor el tiempo, voy a... Thank you, Moisés. To use my time better, I shall speak Spanish. The question that was asked is meant to visualize Latin America in 10 more years. I agree with my namesake here. Latin America is part of a general category, and I would say not so much that we are different, because we are, yes, but above that, we have behaved differently. The characteristics of our institutions and governments have made results quite unequal, different among themselves. And if we look back, what we find is that the countries that have made intensive progress in the last two decades once decide, they sometimes decided to change the course of their policies. In Peru, profound reform took place. In Brazil, it was the same case. So in many countries, policies have been corrected along the course, and this is what accounts for better results, not only in the macroeconomic indicators and growth rates, but also the life standard of the people has improved, and that is quite significant. And then in the future, I think it will be the same. There are still many areas that we have to work upon. Our governments are usually slow when it comes to policy reforms, but what we can say ahead of time is that those who take that initiative decisively, decisively because we all know what we have to do, we know what are the actions of to improve in terms of competitiveness, improving the educational system, and fighting corruption, and then attracting capitals. All of that is the goal, but, what, but it will not all be achieved at the same time. But those countries that take the right decisions at the right time will have much better results and then the gap between the performance of the countries and the social welfare will be closed to that extent. What I wanted to pose you is, uh, and to all of you, is imagine uh, this meeting 10 years ago, the Latin American regional meeting of the World Economic Forum. Try to remember what were uh, the discussions 10 years ago in Latin America? What were the problems? What were the priorities? What were the challenges? And let's talk a little bit about which of these problems are no longer with us and which of the problems are now, what are the new problems that we're now talking about that were not with us 10 years ago? Jim, would you care to start? Sure. You know, I think when you look back 10 years, there were substantially more macroeconomic problems in the region uh, inflation in many, many uh, of the countries was, was substantial. Um, I think there was a lot of political instability uh, 10 years ago that, that is much, much less an issue today. I think, the, uh, I think there was, frankly, a lot less need 10 years ago for intra-region coordination than there is today in moving forward. So I think that, that the dialogue would have been much different 10 years ago. As I look today forward, I think the risks are not some of those that, that were there 10 years ago. I think one of the risks that I see to, to sort of my rosy outlook is if in fact this region collectively and the countries within the region individually um, don't see the power of cooperation 
uh, don't see the power of coordination in terms of policy responses to, to all issues, uh, then I think there's a serious challenge. The, the world really came together during this financial crisis. Uh, you might call it the G20ization of the world, but the responses weren't identical, but the policy issues were thought about the same, whether it was capital in the banks, liquidity, how to deal with toxic assets, fiscal stimulus, you name it. And as coordinated as the world was during the crisis, I do fear that in the recovery, once we're no longer looking over the edge, there will be a tendency of countries or regions to go it alone. I think that would be really bad for I won't call it Latin America, so I'll get yelled at, but for this region. Uh, so I think that's a risk. I think there is a risk today that is still there. Um, if, if the corruption issue is not aggressively tackled um, over the next decade, that that could be a barrier to the growth. And uh, I think there is uh, enormous potential on the positive side, risk on the negative side, dealing with the entrepreneur. If the entrepreneurs are fully engaged in the game and empowered and, and let loose, I think there's just enormous job growth and, and economic vitality. If the entrepreneurs stay on the sideline for some reason, then I think that, again, will really be a barrier. Thank you very much. Jorge. Great differences uh, from the point of view of the Colombian experience. Ten years ago, we certainly wouldn't have been able to hold a meeting like this with this number of attendants and this quality of attendance, uh, mainly for the security situation. I have had a, the experience of uh, trying to penetrate the international capital market for 15 years. And certainly we were very glad to be successful, but in the first years it was difficult to bring investors to Colombia. And sometimes you had the experience of uh, uh, having a phone call of someone that told you, well, we have decided to go to Colombia, but uh, we wanted to know if you are absolutely sure that we are going to be safe there. And, <laughs> and uh, it was a quite difficult question to answer because I am not certainly uh, that I can guarantee that you are going to be sure in Washington, Moises, uh, are you? <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, right now this situation certainly had an influence in foreign direct investment and in the internal development of the country because um, in the countries uh, we have had uh, the possibility of going more into the mining development and agricultural development that so probably will not be possible to have at that time. Also we have some more recognition of Latin America as a clear player uh, in the um, uh, world market. Um, ten years ago, certainly there was the attraction of the potentialities of making big gains in the Latin American market that was opening at the time. In the beginning of the 90s, most of our economies were deregulated, and the people came with the uh, um, potentiality of getting big gains very quickly as they had done before in Asia. Right now we see an entirely different uh, uh, approach. We see a lot of very professional investors that want to understand the area better, that want to understand the region better, and that are very specialized in the different lines of businesses. We certainly celebrate that. And the stability of our economies. Already mentioned the, the, the inflation has come down. We have uh, got accustomed to have one digit inflation, but that was quite rare about 10 and even more 20 years ago. Uh, we have low interest rates and low margins, and that uh, has become a very good framework for the uh, promotion of new businesses and new investment and for the promotion of the development of our infrastructure. Thank you, Jorge. Luis Fernando Furlan. Yes, well, 10 years ago, Brazil was suffering of the uh, currency crisis that began in 1999. Uh, Brazil at that time had very low level of international reserves and there was a big devaluation and that uh, created a lot of problems internally in, in our country. 
quite different than today where we have $250 billion reserves and we not only pay the IMF, but now we lend $10 billion to the IMF in order to help other countries. So inflation due to the valuation and, and it was still a problem, minor problem, but still a problem. And it was quite interesting that the opposition, the political party, the strongest party of the opposition conducted by Lula da Silva was uh, criticizing the government at that time. And, and uh, business people were afraid that if uh, that uh, political party could win the elections, maybe uh, a big entrepreneur in Brazil said that uh, the airport would be crowded of business people going out of Brazil if Lula could win the elections one day. So quite a change uh, after just 10 years. There was the expectation of the meeting to be held in Doha, launching the Doha round that would uh, open the markets for agriculture. It's still pending after almost 10 years, and we almost reached it to an agreement, but at the end, everybody likes to open the other people market and, and to keep the fences in your own backyard. You heard here yesterday and today, including uh, my friend from Italy uh, saying, uh, about opening the markets, and we are trying to sell our, our products in US and Europe uh, for more than 20 years. Anyway, there was a high expectation about regional integration, and there was the issue of NAFTA a few years before, and so the Andean countries, the Mercosur, and, uh, and at the end, I, it's a very shy result, I believe, after 10 years. We keep looking north, and the big change is that uh, the appearing of the multilatinas, that is uh, really new. There is a book uh, written by Lourdes Casanova, professor at the INSEAD, about the multilatinas, and you see here, I, I was talking with Jorge and other members of this uh, meeting that we are investing outside. We, Brazil is the second largest foreign investor in Canada. And if you see, I will tell a short story about a friend that was in St. Louis, Missouri, and there was a change of temperature and he went to a store uh, to buy a jacket. And with the crisis, he was most welcome shopper. And, and then he began to talk with the salesman. And when he's answering the salesman, he said he's, he was Brazilian. He said, oh, you Brazilian. And a lot of bad names. He said, my grandfather worked here for Budweiser. My father worked for Budweiser, and now you Brazilians, you come here and you think you are owners of this icon of, of US, because, you know, Ambev and Imbev and the CEO of Budweiser is a Brazilian, the CFO is a Brazilian. So that's quite a change that people from our region, they are running companies outside Brazil large companies, listed companies, and that is happening. Nice brands in Europe and other parts of the world are now in hands of uh, Latin American com companies. That's quite a change, it's a learning curve, and I'm happy that uh, we are discussing about the future. So my son that is here, he never heard about inflation. His generation, the guys that are voting today, they never heard about inflation. They were born with cell phones and computers and video games. And, and they cannot imagine that there was a period with fax or with telex 
or with telegraph. We are old-fashioned people here, I can see. <laughs> Maybe the closing section of next year, we need to blend clouds. Some new people to, to give us fresh ideas about the future. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Fernando Alarcón. Bueno, lo primero, tengo que... The first thing that I must say is to support Jorge Londaño and his comments on Colombia because I think that this transformation is enormous for us who live in this country. As a matter of fact, 10 years ago it would have been impossible to hold, host this meeting in Colombia. I am going to go back not 10 years but 20 years because I have direct experiences in those days. At that time I was ceasing to be the Minister of Finance and I'm going to refer to some of the things that how these have changed, our economies have been transformed and our countries have been changed. Something that has been said, macroeconomic stability. At that time, Colombia was the model in, on inflationary policy, but we had an inflation in the order of 25%. For today's standards, that is a deflation. Evidently, we were living very proud because we were the country with the least inflation in the region because the others had three or more digits of inflation it sometimes. <clears throat> this no longer has taken place and we trust that in the future this will be so. The operation of financial markets and the financing of our economies during the 80s and the debt crisis, uh, Colombia was a good little boy in school. We were the only ones to be able to maintain our relationships with the international financial system. We did not restructure the debt. We paid things on a timely basis, notwithstanding the fact that to be able to finance ourselves, it was necessary to go into the market to syndicate uh, credits. That is one billion, two billion dollars a year. Each of these credits could probably take six months of structuring negotiations with banks. I had to turn, go around the world uh, three times to be able to do that. Today, yesterday, uh, they didn't know that the country was placing bonds, uh, floating bonds, 800 million dollars as uh, something that, as a matter of fact as something that nothing new we as a company financed the purchases of reasonable amounts we are an immense corporation but we make our purchases uh, 200 300 500 uh, million dollars and we're able to obtain that those funds in markets without the need of anybody's help simply on the basis of the credit capacity and the credibility of our company and the excellent relations that we have developed with the national markets. And history perhaps can continue and continue that way because truly changes with all of the problems that we've had, but changes are of a dramatic and substantial nature, even in language, Moises. Take note of this. Uh, at the beginning of the 90s, we started uh, the stage of uh, structural changes in the economies of the region. And as I was mentioning before, some have been more accelerated than others, uh, better managed than in others. But this wave of transformation began. We talked about the Washington consensus and these things, and there were some discussions that were terrible, because several words that were evil and uh, were not to talk about privatization was an evil word. That was terrible. Today the problem has been solved. Uh, now we talk about public-private partnerships and now we are accepting the fact that things are in that manner and we've made this type of public-private associations in the electric systems, in different types of utilities, uh, 10,000 things in uh, health, in uh, pension funds, and transformations have been accepted by societies, and we have also learned to use a different sort of uh, acceptable language for most people. So within 10, 20 years from behind us, the uh, changes in our countries are dramatic. Thank you very much, Luis Fernando. In terms of the big arc of history, 10 years is nothing. 
but yet the, this description of uh, the differences uh, in 10 years is like it's a different planet. We are, in, and that shows you both the potential also. Uh, it's a good way of uh, thinking about the future, the next 10 years. I would w now open the floor to your questions, comments, your own summaries uh, of uh, uh, this meeting or any comments you want to make. There are people with microphones around. And so just uh, raise your hands and I will recognize you. Over there. And uh, as normal, please tell us who you are. So, uh, I'm Susana Padua uh, from Brazil. Um, I would like to stress the importance of the environment for Latin America, which was a question I wanted to address the presidents, but unfortunately, um, there was no time. I think we have an opportunity in Latin America with uh, the richness of our environment, and uh, we need to stop exploiting nature as uh, we have done traditionally. And I think it's a source of um, richness that we need to look at it in an economic way and to see the environmental services and the possibility of really funding um, the forests and the ecosystems that are still integral in, in a way that makes sense to uh, investors. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and certainly, 10 years ago, the environment would have not been a, a, a subject, even though I have to tell you that uh, the World Economic Forum was a pioneer uh, on bringing the environment to the conversation. And I still remember sessions in Davos where the environment was brought, and nobody would go to those sessions. Uh, people were not interested. And now uh, the environment is at the core. Of, uh, of our conversation, and in Latin America, um, two of the countries represented here, Brazil and Colombia, are two of the largest Amazonian uh, together. Uh, Brazil is the first Amazonian country, and Colombia is the second in terms of, this, uh, of the territory of the Amazon, and are, is a crucial element uh, for any conversation about the environment. I don't know if any of you would like to. Yeah, I would like to make a comment because I had the pleasure to coordinate one of the panels uh, of the Ideas Lab, very interactive, where Susanna had participated. And uh, uh, many ideas appeared there, and the possibility to replicate good initiatives in, within the region. And as you are m mentioning, uh, these, the countries of the regions that are sharing this Amazon uh, rainforest are maybe altogether the largest reservoir of biodiversity and water, about more than one-fourth of the, the, the water in the world is within the region. And this could be seen as a big asset, a big opportunity in order to enhance The countries used to be defensive uh, related to this because somebody was saying that the region is so important that needs to have uh, supervision, international supervision. That is not in discussion. We are able to manage our assets. But uh, I believe that there is one issue that will be discussed in uh, the next uh, meeting in Cancun, which is our ground, not like Copenhagen that is far away, which is the so-called red, reducing uh, emissions of deforestation and degradation. If we reach to an agreement in order to give some benefit, economic benefit, to those countries that can eliminate or reduce deforestation, that will be the cheapest way in the world for conservation, because to recover an area that is gone, it costs a lot of money. And today, I asked, and I understand it was approved, to put in the conclusions of this forum that Latin American leaders from a broad range of business across the value chain of land use, alongside governance and non-governmental organization and academia, are ready to act to avoid deforestation. And the World Economic Forum and its partners urge business leaders, governments, and UN, FCCC to act and to scale up 
Red Plus initiatives in Latin America and worldwide. That's the proposal that I believe that could be an outcome from this meeting and will hopefully flourish up to Cancun to get an agreement so, that will benefit the region. Very good points, Jim. Thank you. Yeah, I'll be very quick in addition to that. Uh, I think the question was spot on, uh, and I think that uh, I would change one thing. In your question, you said that, that the countries in this region have an opportunity to do something. I think we all have a responsibility to do something. I think the countries have a responsibility. I think the companies, each of ours up here, I think the NGOs have responsibilities. I think each of us as individuals have responsibility. And I think we need to, to actually really aggressively pursue that, both in, in our own footprints uh, on the environment, uh, in my profession, we, there's more we should do to, to help ensure a very stable and consistent and, and enforceable uh, way to report footprints and report uh, environmental impact to the broad range of stakeholders uh, that companies uh, engage with. And so I think we need to take this extraordinarily seriously. Yeah, the role of the private sector here is, has to be brought in. Adelante. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, on this issue and going beyond that uh, which each of us on a responsible way should do with reference to the environment, uh, companies, individuals, all of the stakeholders, the problem is an international problem of major consequences. And in reality, only when international community in a serious manner designs economic mechanisms that are rational with the appropriate incentives so that everything that must be done and every actions that must be taken must be done within economic rules that can fulfill the objectives, I think that that situation is not going to advance properly. A good example of uh, South Americans could do to the world is to join the eight countries that are shareholders, stakeholders of the Amazon region and to reach to a convergent position about uh, deforestation. Sir, here. Microphone here, please. Thank you, uh, Stephen Donahue from McClarty Associates. I'm pleased to hear your concept for the very positive future of the region, but in the sessions that I attended, there were two issues that pose a threat to siphoning off some of the resources that need to go to many of the issues that confront the region. One of those was corruption and the other one was the increasing regional, political, and military polarization that is becoming militarized in some respect and siphoning tremendous uh, resources away from some of the other issues. What things can you recommend that we as business people and uh, government leaders can do to try to focus the attention of the region on reducing those two issues so that the region no longer falls behind the rest of the world in the globalization that's taking place. Jorge, why don't you take that, that question, please? Well, yes, um, uh, I think that there are those uh, challenges and some other related challenges which are very serious. Uh, certainly the point of the corruption is uh, is a matter of preoccupation for all the region, for Colombia in particular. And um, I believe that some progress has been made and probably is indicated that that might be one of the ways in which we may gain progress into that by just measuring and giving transparency to those situations, particularly in corruption. We were talking earlier today that uh, the uh, situation of Colombia is uh, uh, very difficult from the point of view of the judiciary system. But if we do what we have been doing, a uh, total spotlight of the problems that we are facing, and we measure them as we have been doing in gaining 
competitiveness of the market in other areas, competitivity of the countries in other areas, we certainly are going to join forces to solve those problems because the society as a whole is absolutely committed to the progress against corruption. The good people is more than the bad people. And if we all commit our forces in improving in those areas, we are going to gain momentum for, for gaining that. I would like to mention an, one, one element that is very much related with that of corruption um, from my point of view, which is also a problem, and is the problem of violence, in, uh, violence supported by narco-traffic, which is the main uh, promoter of corruption in our e economies, in our, in our societies. I am quite uh, worried and surprised of the line that it has taken uh, particularly recently in Mexico, because we see a strong debate on whether it is worth to confront the narco-traffic vi inspired violence. And uh, certainly it should be a matter of preoccupation for the entire region to uh, take a very firm stand against that. I think that it is not possible for a society to start a process of modernization without very clearly establishing who are the bad and who are the good people. If we don't have that absolutely clear, and we face that with a very realistic manner. I don't believe that we could pretend to be the single area of the world where the criminals are just, you know, uh, erased from the face of the earth. But we certainly have to be together with the world of having a very clear uh, moral standpoint of where the society stands and who are we going to defend and who are we going to attack. Thank you. Very briefly, each one of you, just uh, yeah. well, 30 just, seconds. Just a brief comment. Uh, the use of technology for on, online uh, auctions and you know, government acquisitions and the transparency help a lot in order to reduce the possibility of corruption. And the exercise of the rule of law, Brazil has had about one month ago an incredible move that for the first time ever, a governor on duty of the federal district of Brasilia was put in jail because of corruption. And the deputy governor could not replace because he was also involved and he is still in jail. So when you show to people that high level politicians or businessmen they are on the arm's length of the rule of law. That is a good example for people to take care because right now you can go to the jail. Jim. Yeah, very quickly, I think there's some specific things that can be done around corruption. And I'm a board member of a World Economic Forum uh, organization called PACHI, Partner Against Corruption Initiative. And, and I would encourage all of you to look at the PACHI principles study them, commit to them, sign on to them. It's a wonderful organization that I think is doing great things. We had a meeting before this WEF session started uh, here in Cartagena that was attended by participants from across the region. Um, and some of it was discouraging, some was encouraging. The most discouraging part was when someone talked about the, the systems in place in various countries and how they were imperfect and someone else responded, no, they're not imperfect. They're perfectly set up for corruption uh, with, with bribes and other graft being the oil that makes the system work. The encouraging part was the commentary, and, and uh, Jorge just commented on it, that the youth of today absolutely understand just how devastatingly bad this corruption is for economic growth and activity and will help guide all of us to a better place. But please, do study the PACHI initiatives and PACHI principles. A very brief comment. The problem is that these issues that you are mentioning are a part of the 
category that is a great umbrella that covers uh, the behavior of society and uh, of those things that are necessary to do. And this is the topic of government, uh, democracy, institutions, good governance in general. Th the reality is that this is one of the risks that we face in these countries, in these democracies, uh, sudden abrupt changes that can lead us to a very serious type of deterioration of political practice incentivating these consequences. And I have a lot of hands, uh, so I would have to ask your questions, so please be brief, and uh, I will give only one of you the opportunity to uh, reply. No, I think there is somebody there, and then perhaps you. Go ahead. Uh, Alberto Ballmer from Venezuela. Um, I, I, uh, I think the, the underlying uh, message that we have all received is that from 10 years back to now, Latin America has grown in trust levels. Um, the other thing, I, I was attaching that to the comment of Mr. The President Uribe said, that his agenda from day one was the trust agenda. And trust agenda has been focused on fighting violence and drugs. And one of the things we've seen is that Latin America is one of the most violent places in the world. My, my question has to do with how do we build a common trust agenda? I don't, we haven't talked about building a trust agenda and how that can be linked to UNASUR and the, the mission and the objective of UNASUR. Who do you want uh, to address this? Uh, it could be you or it could be anyone <laughs> you say. <laughs> Jim, why don't you take this, please? <laughs> Look, I, I think that uh, the issue of trust is, is a challenging one. Trust cannot be imposed. Democracy can't be imposed. Both of these have to be earned. And I think you earn trust through transparency. You earn trust through inclusion of a wide differing portfolio of perspectives, listening to all different points of view, uh, you earn trust by consistency and staying very focused on, on the core principles and values that, uh, that, that really should drive any of us as companies or any of us as countries or regions. And so that's the best I could do with that. Thank you. The gentleman here. Uh, I have a question in Spanish. Please, your name? Carlos Matos. I have a question, and I will do so in Spanish to be able to put a little bit of salt and pepper to our forum. Everything that I have heard uh, during these days is uh, surrounding an integration of Latin America, of an improvement of Latin American economy, of an uh, economic improvement that has ensued during the last 10 years. However, there is something that all of us entrepreneurs are concerned about, especially those of us who are here in Colombia and in Venezuela. This I point, I do not know if it's a matter of fear or if it's a very sensitive issue that we almost have not touched upon, but I, I will do so. What is going to happen in the coming 10 years if we have presidents in our hemisphere that are, how could I put it, uh, that are quite belligerent, where we even reach a position of uh, lacking respect on a public basis to other presidents of Latin America. Do you have any specific uh, example in mind? <clears throat> Our neighbor. But this has led us to the fact that there is a weapons uh, and warring uh, entitlement. I think we understand the question. Please, somebody answer it. I feel that the matter has been mentioned, Carlos. I think that uh, several of us have insisted on the matter that Latin America is not a single Latin America, 
but uh, rather that uh, to its in, in its inside there are different governments, different economies, different societies. Differences that are quite uh, considerable and this is the reality that you are addressing. That's, that's where I want to, to get to. I'm sorry, there are too many hands. Uh, we can't have a dialogue. We will have to leave this. There's a gentleman over there that I think was wishing also to participate. My name is Bruce McMaster, also from Colombia, and my question uh, was in the same general sense, thinking that it's good to be optimistic, that a forum like this should conclude with such optimism. Colombia and Latin America are doing well right now. We have no doubt about this uh, behavior, but there's also no doubt that instability is in the environment. But I wanted to say that instability, not only political, but military and economic. It would not be fair with the title of this panel especially to call your attention to the fact that we have to adopt measures and be prepared for a highly volatile environment within these next 10 years. Luis uh, Fernando Fulan, volatility and militarization of the region. I'm going to speak in uh, Portuñol. For quite a while, the first hypothesis, the war hypothesis of Brazil, was against Argentina, uh, the KG1. And uh, the entire southern part of Brazil was fortified. Rio Grande do Sul had more military personnel than the, the federal capital. Then came Mercosur, and there was a distension. And from potential enemies, we became partners. And then we saw that uh, we had the entire north of Brazil, the Amazon region, that did not have an owner as such because it was an extraordinarily large area and uh, military positions were very, very scarce. So now the Amazon region is the main frontier for protection that Brazil has. And uh, we are having uh, helicopters and we are assisting Colombia in the rescue with military personnel, uh, peaceful personnel. So Brazil has a special ability of having many neighbors and not having bilateral problems. And we wish to continue in this manner. Thank you. My name is Jorge Medina, I'm from Peru, and because I may be uh, quite provocative, I will say this in Spanish. Regarding the last two questions, I believe, and I'm going to make this statement, I think that the governments of Latin American countries, we have the governments that entrepreneurs deserve, and I will say why. Enterprises are the ones that move the world. There's nothing more important. Please be brief and, uh, yes. Since enterprises move the world, we have a greater responsibilities. If we are not inclusive, responsible, if we do not take part in the education and the infrastructure and safety and security, we are going to generate governments that now we are criticizing. Thank you, Jorge. Hey, you pointed out uh, some of uh, the most serious challenges. We I, I absolutely agree with you in the sense that we have, from the private sector, a great responsibility on education, on integration, and uh, in participation in our societies. We have to get employment and formal employment uh, in the country. That is much uh, easier to say than to do, in the sense that we have been working a lot in trying to understand why our economies have such a low capacity of generating employment. And there are a lot of proposals. And when you come to analyze them, it's not a problem that is solved just by changing a tax or by changing a 
charge a fiscal charge in the, in the companies. It uh, requires much more than that. We are in the process of uh, creating a continent that is developed and we have a lot of economic and social problems, but I, am, uh, I keep in the, 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 the very optimistic view that we certainly have progressed a lot when we do the exercise of looking at our continent 10 years ago and we see what we have progress, we certainly have the capacity of facing those problems of equality and, and, uh, and uh, progressing in the solution of them. Los empresarios asumen riesgos. Entrepreneurs assume risks, but the capital is afraid. What we will harvest in the future then will be what we will be the growth of the seeds that we are planting and capitals that and the countries that attract good cop capital will have good companies. But those who are attacking entrepreneurs will certainly not go along that path. I am from Mexico. I think that your exercise is very interesting looking back at Latin America for the past 10 years. But we should also ask how China and Spain and Ireland and Singapore were doing 10 years ago. And how, where shall we stand compared to them? Are we going to advance at the right pace? I look back at uh, China and Spain and the other places you've talked about 10 years ago. Um, I think what a similarity that this region of the world has to China, in my opinion, is that you both are acting as sponges for learning. China really wants to learn how free enterprise and how capitalism works all around the world. And they don't care you know, where they're learning from. They want to figure out how we're doing it, and they want to figure out then how to adapt it to their own environment and win. I think that this region of the world is also all about learning. Um, I think, I don't, I would not say that about Spain, candidly. Uh, I don't see the, the, the intellectual curiosity of wanting to learn uh, new ways, and, and there are many countries and many parts of the world that I don't see as being learning sort of organizations. So I actually think that that willingness to, to change, willingness to learn, is going to put this part of the world on the same path, keep them on the same path, with places like China and India and the Middle East. Thank you. We're really running out of time, so I'm going to take two last questions over there. My name is Jose Luis Prado. I work for PepsiCo in Mexico. So uh, the, the progress made in the last years, great. Um, 18 months ago, somebody said that this crisis was too good to waste it. And uh, I believe being the closing session is very important that the tone of the overall message of the forum is, is a more balanced one. Uh, uh, enjoying the progress, yes, undoubtedly, but I think we have a tremendous task ahead of us. Uh, I have always seen tremendous talent in Latin America. I have, I have lived in six countries, uh, and I always find tremendous talent here. So I would just say, I think we have the right and the obligation to expect much more from our governments, our companies, and about each one of us. So I think we need to generate higher expectations and, and, and move from the analysis of the issues. I think the issues have been identified, have been discussed extensively in the forum. Uh, I think is the moment of the action. Uh, the, the enterprise has, and the companies have a big role to play to help everybody to bring action plans and make things happen. Thank you. Would you please go ahead? Okay. Enrique Dominguez, uh, Consejo Nacional Agropecuario. También. National Council of Mexico for Agriculture. A comment that goes uh, in the same line as my colleague. We see that there's an integration of industry in various sectors such as transport, uh, energy, something that uh, started uh, very similarly in Europe. But the private sector is now acting and integrating on a more aggressive matter and greater importance. I would like a comment on this as a process of integration. 
and Luis Fernando a question also. One of the fundamental factors that uh, was that made it possible for the EU was the common agricultural policy which has made us different. Is it possible that we can work as Latin America and strive to find a single common agricultural policy? One is complacency. And uh, complacency as a major issue, you know, Latin America is doing better compared to where it was, but not sufficiently better compared to competitors. So don't be, you know, the whole issue of complacency and then the issue of integration and agricultural policies. Why don't we, and again, we, we are out of time, so I have to ask you to address these issues very quickly, all of you. Very quick on this, I think the, the first commentary could not be more accurate. Uh, we cannot be complacent. I think one of the things that this region needs to do is make sure that, that we stop the happy talk. We have to talk about the very real issues and some of the questions confronted those. For me, they were about what's going to be done about corruption. They're, they're about really not just thinking about internal cooperation, but internal competition. Because each of the countries in this region will at some time be partners with each other, sometimes be competitors with each other, sometimes be suppliers, sometimes be customers. I think that the issue about the, the neighbor of Colombia, no one seems to want to say the word, um, you know, is, is one that has to get seriously talked about. I actually think one about how we can move the United States to actually pass the free trade agreement with Colombia and other places. These are tough, real issues that have to get confronted. Thank you very much. Hold it. Uh, on the complacency, I, I, I agree with that, and I very much agree with the position that there should be a very proactive and very positive relationship between the private sector and the government, and both of us has to be very critical of each other and try to improve the management and the actions of each one uh, of the sides. And on the integration, I would like a couple of words. Certainly, we were in a previous forum talking to us, to that, and I believe that being pragmatic, it is impossible to believe that we are going to make a common ground of all Latin America. We have spent a lot of time showing the differences of different areas of Latin America, but certainly we have to attempt and we have to dream of a major integration from what we have today. We have to progress in the process of integrating the region, but not dreaming that we are going to have the Latin American common market from uh, the next day. Thank you. Luis Fernando. Yes, uh, I agree that we are running a marathon uh, with a backpack, uh, plenty of stones, and as the countries and the companies are moving, we can release the stones and will be lighter and with better conditions to win the marathon. And I, I made a lot of examples of problems that we still have, are, have pending. The other issue related to agriculture, I believe that we have a real competitiveness Latin American countries to produce food and a lot of products, including bioenergy. And maybe we should focus right now in the good examples, the well-succeeded practices that we can replicate. I know that Colombia is doing that, Brazil is looking that we are using uh, for pasture uh, varieties that came from Africa and were improved in Brazil we can deliver back to Africa or to other countries of Latin America in order to increase productivity for cattle farming and many other areas that maybe we cannot talk to each other and say, what is doing well in your country that we could replicate? And then we can talk about common policies and so on, because today is a lot of asymmetry in the, in the competitiveness of the region. Thank you. Luis Fernando. On this issue of the complacency, I fully agree with uh, what has been mentioned. In, and I mentioned this in some of my comments. Unfortunately, with this matter of the simile of the marathon, uh, Fernando, we go out to the marathon, but last the night before, we uh, made merry, we smoked, we had a lot of drinks. 
So we simply cannot uh, meet our task. Uh, this is why we're a little slow. We're not doing things properly. And within the region, there are some people that are doing it better, and this, of course, is noticeable. But I think that this discipline, and on part of our governments, we have to acquire that. Regarding integration, my recommendation is not be maximalistic, not make the great model of integration. We must go step by step. We have learned this in a very specific and pragmatic issue, which is electric integration. Undoubtedly, there we are leaving on the table a lot of money, but we know that we cannot have a great uh, energy integration uh, model. There are differences, uh, political differences and that other nature. Better to go step by step, finding opportunities, developing these, and these opportunities in turn will provide more ambitious schemes. Thank you. There's a trilogy to think large, think small, and but go quickly. This is what my colleague said. Thank you to join me in thanking our uh, co-chairs of the meeting uh, and bring back um, and bring the, the session to a close. However, I want to invite Professor Klaus Schwab, the founder of the World Economic Forum, to some final words. What they are talking, where they are coming here, I want you to please join me in thanking the four. <laughs> Thank you, Moises. And first, I would like to thank you and particularly the co chairs for the very active involvement and engagement into the discussions over the last 48 hours. I was uh, thinking what has changed because uh, my first Latin American meeting was in 76. Um, now, let me just make one remark. Uh, you, um, Luis, you said we need more young global leaders and so on. But 10 years ago, I think the business community, uh, or what characterized the meetings, was just the presence of business leaders and politicians. And all the other stakeholders would have been seen as some kind of disturbing factors. The fact that we had a real multi-stakeholder composition of the participants. I think this is something which would not have been thinkable 10 years ago. And also in this respect, the terms which we used like um, global citizenship, corporate citizenship, uh, public-private partnerships, social entrepreneurship, they all didn't exist 10 years ago. And I think this is a very remarkable progress uh, which has been made. Now, when I was sitting here and I was listening, of course I was thinking what should be the theme of the next annual meeting because we don't want just to repeat. Of course we will update uh, everybody about the situation. And then I had the idea, I just use one word as the theme for the next annual meeting, listening to you. And so the theme would be how. How do we do it? I mean, everything which has been mentioned. And here, of course, the question comes up, where will we meet next year? And I cannot tell you yet exactly when and where, but I can tell you what country we will be in. And I think it will be very appropriate next year with uh, Brazil mentioned so m many times, and we see election uh, taking place in Brazil to be in Brazil about 100 days after the new president has taken office. I know it doesn't correspond to our usual principle to pay tribute to as many countries as possible, but I think this merits an exception next year with the weight which Brazil has for the whole uh, region. So, We will, announce, we will announce the date and uh, the exact place in a few weeks. I would like to use this opportunity to thank Emilio Losoya Austin, whom you all know, uh, who has been in charge of this meeting 
Um, I want to thank him. I want to thank him, his team. And I also want to, to thank him for his uh, loyal um, cooperation with the Forum. Um, he has been one of our global leaders for tomorrow. Uh, well, I'm sorry, one of our global leadership fellows, uh, a program which we have instituted to provide young, exceptional people with extraordinary career opportunities. First inside the forum and afterwards outside the forum. Now he is going outside looking for a career more in the private business community. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you his successor. It's um, Marisol Agueta de Barriles, who was a former uh, foreign minister of El Salvador, who has business and political experience and I can tell you, she brings a lot of passion for this region to the forum. So, and, and it facilitates my work instead of summarizing for the last, let's say, just taking three or five minutes, um, I leave this job being a good delegator to her. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Schwab, for the opportunity of joining this wonderful and prestigious organization. This is another proof of your commitment to increase the participation of women at the World Economic Forum. This fifth regional meeting has been another demonstration of the outstanding leadership and hard work of my predecessor, Emilio Lozoya Austin, and the Latin American team. Under the wise guidance of the founder of the forum, Professor Klaus Schwab. As a newcomer to the forum, I must mention how impressed I am by the high quality of the people and overall very impressed by the outstanding teamwork by everybody in the forum. I must thank the wonderful job that has been done by our translators. I please ask for recognition for them. And I must also recognize and thank Colombia for allowing us to show the world through their window, uh, through the window of the World Economic Forum of what you have uh, achieved, and especially your leadership and the performance of President Alvaro Uribe, of Minister Plata, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Pro-Export through its chairman, Maria Elvira Pombo, and all of the work team that has made this meeting possible, and each and every Colombian who have exposed us to the risk of wanting to stay. Meeting all the expectations and challenges that lie ahead. I, uh, with the best of my capacity and with the passion for Latin America, I'm sure that together with all of you, we will be able to work on that how. The discussions and outcome are, of this meeting are invaluable and confirm the importance of continuing to foster this profound and open dialogue among the multi-stakeholders from business, government, and the civil society, as we're not only discussing the regional priorities and the most important global trends, but also as we participate actively in the construction of the agenda for, the, for Latin America. I'm sure we're all left with a very optimistic perspective of our region. And I thank all the participants and invite you to continue engaged with us and to reflect on Latin America's three critical imperatives where a wide participation is needed. First, to accelerate economic growth, to tackle the risks like corruption, polarization, and violence, 
and to become more competitive. Second, to improve the way we live and to earn that common trust agenda. Third, to take the responsibility and the opportunity to leverage the global sustainability agenda, shaping it and benefiting from it. I remain at your disposal as head of Latin America to construct with you the roads for that dream that one of the global change makers mentioned of building a Latin America 2.0. Molto obrigada. And will hopefully flourish up to Cancun to get an agreement that will benefit the region. Very good points, Jim. Thank you. Yeah, I'll be very quick in addition to that. Uh, I think the question was spot on, uh, and I think that uh, I would change one thing. In your question, you said that, that the countries in this region have an opportunity to do something. I think we all have a responsibility to do something. I think the countries have a responsibility. I think the companies, each of ours up here, I think the NGOs have responsibilities. I think each of us as individuals have responsibility. And I think we need to, to actually really aggressively pursue that, both in, in our own footprints uh, on the environment, uh, in my profession, we, there's more we should do to, to help ensure a very stable and consistent and, and enforceable uh, way to report footprints and report uh, environmental impact to the broad range of stakeholders that, that companies uh, engage with. And so I think we need to take this extraordinarily seriously. Now the role of the private sector here is, has to be brought in. Adelante. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, on this issue and going beyond that uh, which each of us on a responsible way should do with reference to the environment, uh, companies, individuals, all of the stakeholders, the problem is an international problem of major consequences. And in reality, only when international community in a serious manner designs economic mechanisms that are rational with the appropriate incentives so that everything that must be done and every actions that must be taken must be done within economic rules that can fulfill the objectives, I think that that situation is not going to advance properly. A good example of uh, South Americans could do to the world is to join the eight countries that are shareholders, stakeholders of the Amazon region and to reach to a convergent position about uh, deforestation. Sir, here. Microphone here, please. Thank you, uh, Stephen Donahue from McClarty Associates. I'm pleased to hear your concept for the very positive future of the region, but in the sessions that I attended, there were two issues that pose a threat to siphoning off some of the resources that need to go to many of the issues that confront the region. One of those was corruption and the other one was the increasing regional, political, and military polarization that is becoming militarized in some respect and siphoning tremendous uh, resources away from some of the other issues. What things can you recommend that we as business people and uh, government leaders can do to try to focus the attention of the region on reducing those two issues so that the region no longer falls behind the rest of the world in the globalization that's taking place. Jorge, why don't you take that, that question, please? Well, yes, um, uh, I think that there are those uh, challenges and some other related challenges which are very serious. Uh, certainly the point of the corruption is uh, is a matter of preoccupation for all the region, for Colombia in particular, and um, I believe that some progress has been made, and 
probably is indicated that that might be one of the ways in which we may gain progress into that by just measuring and giving transparency to those situations, particularly in corruption. We were talking earlier today that uh, the uh, situation of Colombia is uh, uh, very difficult from the point of view of the judiciary system. But if we do what we have been doing, a uh, total spotlight of the problems that we are facing, and we measure them as we have been doing in gaining competitiveness of the market in other areas, competitivity of the countries in other areas, we certainly are going to join forces to solve those problems. Because the society as a whole is absolutely committed to the progress against corruption. The good people is more than the bad people. And if we all commit our forces in improving in those areas, we are going to gain momentum for, for gaining that. I would like to mention an, one, one element that is very much related with that of corruption um, from my point of view, which is also a problem, and is the problem of violence. In, uh, violence supported by narco-traffic, which is the main uh, promoter of corruption in our e economies, in our, in our societies. I am quite uh, worried and surprised of the line that it has taken, uh, particularly recently in Mexico, because we see a strong debate on whether it is worth to confront the narco-traffic inspired violence. And uh, certainly it should be a matter of preoccupation for the entire region to uh, take a very firm stand against that. I think that it is not possible for a society to start a process of modernization without very clearly establishing who are the bad and who are the good people. If we don't have that absolutely clear, and we face that with a very realistic manner. I don't believe that we could pretend to be the single area of the world where the criminals are just, you know, uh, erased from the face of the earth. But we certainly have to be together with the world of having a very clear uh, moral standpoint of where the society stands and who are we going to defend and who are we going to attack. Thank you. Very briefly, each one of you, just yeah. uh, well, 30 just, seconds. Just a brief comment. Uh, the use of technology for on, online uh, auctions and you know, government acquisitions and the transparency help a lot in order to reduce the possibility of corruption. And the exercise of the rule of law. Brazil has had, about one month ago, an incredible move that, for the first time ever, a governor on duty of the federal district of Brasilia was put in jail because of corruption. And the deputy governor could not replace because he was also involved. And he is still in jail. So when you show to people that high-level politicians or businessmen they are on the arm's length of the rule of law. That is a good example for people to take care because right now you can go to the jail. Jim. Yeah, very quickly, I think there's some specific things that can be done around corruption. And I'm a board member of a World Economic Forum uh, organization called PACHI, Partner Against Corruption Initiative. And, and I would encourage all of you to look at the PACHI principles study them, commit to them, sign on to them. It's a wonderful organization that I think is doing great things. We had a meeting before this WEF session started uh, here in Cartagena. It was attended by participants from across the region. Um, and some of it was discouraging, some was encouraging. The most discouraging part was when someone talked about the, the systems in place in various countries and how they were imperfect and someone else responded, no, they're not imperfect. They're perfectly set up for corruption uh, with, with bribes and other graft being the oil that makes the system work. 
the encouraging part was the commentary, and, and uh, Jorge just commented on it, that the youth of today absolutely understand just how devastatingly bad this corruption is for economic growth and activity and will help guide all of us to a better place. But please do study the Pachi initiatives and Pachi principles. A very brief comment. The problem is that these issues that you are mentioning are a part of the category that is the great umbrella that covers uh, the behavior of society and uh, of those things that are necessary to do. And this is the topic of government, uh, democracy, institutions, good governance in general. Th the reality is that this is one of the risks that we face in these countries, in these democracies, uh, sudden abrupt changes that can lead us to a very serious type of deterioration of political practice incentivating these consequences. And I have a lot of hands, uh, so I would have to ask your questions, so please be brief, and uh, I will give only one of you the opportunity to uh, reply. No, I think there is somebody there, and then perhaps you. Okay, uh, Alberto Ballmer from Venezuela. Um, I, I, uh, I think the, the underlying uh, message that we have all received is that from 10 years back to now, Latin America has grown in trust levels. Um, the other thing I, I was attaching that to the comment of Mr. The President Uribe said, that his agenda from day one was the trust agenda. And trust agenda has been focused on fighting violence and drugs. And one of the things we've seen is that Latin America is one of the most violent places in the world. My, my question has to do with how do we build a common trust agenda? I don't, we haven't talked about building a trust agenda and how that can be linked to UNASUR and the, the mission and the objective of UNASUR. Who do you want uh, to address this? Uh, it could be you, or it could be anyone <laughs> you say. <laughs> Jim, why don't you take this, please? <laughs> Gee, thanks. <laughs> Look, I, I think that uh, the issue of trust is, is a challenging one. Trust cannot be imposed. Democracy can't be imposed. Both of these have to be earned. And I think you earn trust through transparency, you earn trust through inclusion of a wide differing portfolio of perspectives, listening to all different points of view. Uh, you earn trust by consistency and staying very focused on, on the core principles and values that, uh, that, that really should drive any of us as companies or any of us as countries or regions. And so that's the best I could do with that. Thank you. The gentleman here. Uh, I have a question in Spanish. Please, your name? Carlos Matos. I have a question, and I will do so in Spanish to be able to put a little bit of salt and pepper to our forum. Everything that I have heard uh, during these days is... Uh, surrounding an integration of Latin America, of an improvement of Latin American economy, of an economic improvement that has ensued during the last 10 years. However, there is something that all of us entrepreneurs are concerned about, especially those of us who are here in Colombia and in Venezuela. This I point, I do not know if it's a matter of fear or if it's a very sensitive issue that we almost have not touched upon, but I, I will do so. What is going to happen in the coming 10 years if we have presidents in our hemisphere that are, how could I put it, uh, that are quite belligerent where we even reach a position of uh, lacking respect on a public basis to other presidents of Latin America. Do you have any specific uh, example in mind? 
<coughs> our neighbor. But this has led us to the fact that there is a weapons uh, and warring uh, in time. I think we understand the question. Please, somebody answer it. I feel that the matter has been mentioned, Carlos. I think that uh, several of us have insisted on the matter that Latin America is not a single Latin America, but uh, rather that uh, to its in, in its inside there are different governments, different economies, different societies. Differences that are quite uh, considerable, and this is the reality that you are addressing. That's, that's where I want to, to get to. I'm sorry, there are too many hands. Uh, we can't have a dialogue. We will have to leave this. There's a gentleman over there that I think was wishing also to participate. My name is Bruce McMaster, also from Colombia, and my question uh, was in the same general sense, thinking that it's good to be optimistic, that a forum like this should conclude with such optimism. Colombia and Latin America are doing well right now. We have no doubt about this uh, behavior, but there's also no doubt that instability is in the environment. But I wanted to say that instability, not only political, but military and economic. It would not be fair with a title of this panel especially to call your attention to the fact that we have to adopt measures and be prepared for a highly volatile environment within these next 10 years. Luis uh, Fernando Furlan, volatility and militarization of the region. I'm going to speak in uh, Portuñol. For quite a while, the first hypothesis, the war hypothesis of Brazil, was against Argentina, uh, the KG-1. And uh, the entire southern part of Brazil was fortified. Rio Grande do Sul had more military personnel than the, the federal capital. Then came Mercosur, and there was a distension. And from potential enemies, we became partners. And then we saw that uh, we had the entire north of Brazil, the Amazon region, that did not have an owner as such because there was an extraordinarily large area and uh, military positions were very, very scarce. So now the Amazon region is the main frontier for protection that Brazil has. And uh, we are having uh, helicopters and we are assisting Colombia in the rescue with military personnel, uh, peaceful personnel. So Brazil has a special ability of having many neighbors and not having bilateral problems. And we wish to continue in this manner. Thank you. My name is Jorge Medina, I'm from Peru, and because I may be uh, quite provocative, I will say this in Spanish. Regarding the last two questions, I believe, and I'm going to make this statement, I think that the governments of Latin American countries, we have the governments that entrepreneurs deserve, and I will say why. Enterprises are the ones that move the world. There's nothing more important. Please be brief and, uh, yes. Since enterprises move the world, we have a greater responsibilities. If we are not inclusive, responsible, if we do not take part in the education and the infrastructure and safety and security, we are going to generate governments that now we are criticizing. Thank you, Jorge. Hey, you pointed out uh, some of uh, the most serious challenges. We. I, I absolutely agree with you in the sense that we have, from the private sector, a great responsibility on education, on integration, 
and uh, a participation in our societies. We have to get employment and formal employment uh, in the country. That is much uh, easier to say than to do in the sense that we have been working a lot in trying to understand why our economies have such a low capacity of generating employment. And there are a lot of proposals. And when you come to analyze them, it's not a problem that is solved just by changing a tax or by changing a charge, a fiscal charge in the, in the companies. It requires much more than that. We are in the process of uh, creating a continent that is developed, and we have a lot of economic and social problems, but I, am, uh, I keep in the, 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 the very optimistic view that we certainly have progressed a lot when we do the exercise of looking at our continent 10 years ago and we see what we have progress, we certainly have the capacity of facing those problems of equality and, and, uh, and uh, progressing in the solution of them. Los empresarios asumen riesgos. Entrepreneurs assume risks, but the capital is afraid. What we will harvest in the future then will be what we will be the growth of the seeds that we are planting and capitals that and the countries that attract good cop capital will have good companies but those who are attacking entrepreneurs will certainly not go along that path I am from Mexico I think that your exercise is very interesting looking back at Latin America for the past 10 years, but we should also ask how China and Spain and Ireland and Singapore were doing 10 years ago, and how, where shall we stand compared to them? Are we going to advance at the right pace? You know, when I look back at uh, China and Spain and the other places you've talked about 10 years ago, um, I think what a similarity that this region of the world has to China, in my opinion, is that you both are acting as sponges for learning. China really wants to learn how free enterprise and how capitalism works all around the world. And they don't care you know, where they're learning from, they want to figure out how we're doing it and they want to figure out then how to adapt it to their own environment and win. I think that this region of the world is also all about learning. Um, I think, I don't, I would not say that about Spain, candidly. Uh, I don't see the, the, the intellectual curiosity of wanting to learn uh, new ways, and, and there are many countries and many parts of the world that I don't see as being learning sort of organizations. So I actually think that that Willingness to, to change, willingness to learn, is going to put this part of the world on the same path, keep them on the same path, with places like China and India and the Middle East. Thank you. We're really running out of time, so I'm going to take two last questions over there. Um, my name is Jose Luis Prado. I work for PepsiCo in Mexico. So uh, the, the progress made in the last years, great. Um, 18 months ago, somebody said that this crisis was too good to waste it. And uh, I believe being the closing session is very important that the tone of the overall message of the forum is, is a more balanced one. Uh, uh, enjoying the progress, yes, undoubtedly, but I think we have a tremendous task ahead of us. Uh, I have always seen tremendous talent in Latin America. I, ha I have lived in six countries. Uh, and I always find tremendous talent here. So I would just say, I think we have the right and the obligation to expect much more from our governments, our companies, and about each one of us. So I think we need to generate higher expectations and, and, and move from the analysis of the issues. I think the issues have been identified, have been discussed extensively in the forum, uh, I think is the moment of the action. Uh, the, the enterprise has, and the companies have a big role to play to help everybody to bring action plans and make things happen. Thank you. Would you please go ahead? 
Okay. Enrique National. Domínguez, eh, Consejo Nacional Agropecuario también. National Council of Mexico for Agriculture. A comment that goes uh, in the same line as my colleague. We see that there's an integration of industry in various sectors such as transport, uh, energy, something that uh, started uh, very similarly in Europe. But the private sector is now acting and integrating on a more aggressive matter and greater importance. I would like a comment on this as a process of integration. And Luis Fernando, a question also. One of the fundamental factors that uh, were, that made it possible for the EU was the common agricultural policy which has made us different. Is it possible that we can work as Latin America and strive to find a single common agricultural policy? One is complacency. And uh, complacency as a major issue, you know, Latin America is doing better compared to where it was, but not sufficiently better compared to competitors. So don't be, you know, the whole issue of complacency and then the issue of integration and agricultural policies. Why don't we, and again, we, we are out of time, so I have to ask you to address these issues very quickly, all of you. Very quick on this, I think the, the first commentary could not be more accurate. Uh, we cannot be complacent. I think one of the things that this region needs to do is make sure that, that we stop the happy talk. We have to talk about the very real issues and some of the questions confronted those. For me, they were about what's going to be done about corruption. They're, they're about really not just thinking about internal cooperation, but internal competition. Because each of the countries in this region will at some time be partners with each other, sometimes be competitors with each other, sometimes be suppliers, sometimes be customers. I think that the issue about the, the neighbor of Colombia, no one seems to want to say the word, um, you know, is, is one that has to get seriously talked about. I actually think one about how we can move the United States to actually pass the free trade agreement with Colombia and other places. These are tough, real issues that have to get confronted. Thank you very much. Hold it. Uh, on the complacency, I, I, I agree with that, and I very much agree with the position that there should be a very proactive and very positive relationship between the private sector and the government, and both of us has to be very critical of each other and try to improve the management and the actions of each one of the sides. And on the integration, I would like a couple of words. Certainly, we were in a previous forum talking to us, to that, and believe that being pragmatic, it is impossible to believe that we are going to make a common ground of all Latin America. We have spent a lot of time showing the differences of different areas of Latin America, but certainly we have to attempt and we have to dream of a major integration from what we have today. We have to progress in the process of integrating the region, but not dreaming that we are going to have the Latin American common market from uh, the next day. Thank you. Luis Fernando. Yes, uh, I agree that we are running a marathon uh, with a backpack, uh, plenty of stones, and as the countries and the companies are moving, we can release the stones and will be lighter and with better conditions to win the marathon. And I, I made a lot of examples of problems that we still ha are ha pending. The other issue related to agriculture, I believe that we have a real competitiveness Latin American countries to produce food and a lot of products, including bioenergy. And maybe we should focus right now in the good examples, the well-succeeded practices that we can replicate. I know that Colombia is doing that, Brazil is looking that, we are using uh, for pasture uh, varieties that came from Africa and were improved in Brazil we can deliver back to Africa or to other countries of Latin America in order to increase productivity for cattle farming and many other areas that maybe we cannot talk to each other and say what is doing well in your country that we could replicate and then we can talk about common policies and so on because today is a lot of asymmetry in the, in the competitiveness of the region. Thank you. Luis Fernando.
En el tema de la... On this issue of the complacency, I fully agree with uh, what has been mentioned. In, and I mentioned this in some of my comments. Unfortunately, with this matter of the symbol of the marathon, uh, Fernando, we go out to the marathon, but last the night before, we uh, made merry, we smoked, we had a lot of drinks. So we simply cannot uh, meet our task. Uh, this is why we're a little slow. We're not doing things properly. And within the region, there are some people that are doing it better, and this, of course, is noticeable. But I think that this discipline, and on part of our governments, we have to acquire that. Regarding integration, my recommendation is not be maximalistic, not make the great model of integration. We must go step by step. We have learned this in a very specific and pragmatic issue, which is electric integration. Undoubtedly, there we are leaving on the table a lot of money, but we know that we cannot have a great uh, energy integration uh, model. There are differences, uh, political differences and that other nature. Better to go step by step, finding opportunities, developing these, and these opportunities in turn will provide more ambitious schemes. Thank you. There's a trilogy to think large, think small, and but go quickly. This is what my colleague said. Thank you to join me in thanking our uh, co-chairs of the meeting uh, and bring back um, and bring the, the session to a close. However, I want to invite Professor Klaus Schwab, the founder of the World Economic Forum, to some final words. What they are talking, where they are coming here, I want you to please join me in thanking the four. <laughs> Thank you, Moises, and first I would like to thank you and particularly the court chairs for the very active involvement and engagement into the discussions over the last 48 hours. I was uh, thinking what has changed because uh, my first Latin American meeting was in 76. Um, now, let me just make one remark. Uh, you, um, Luis, you said we need more young global leaders and so on. But 10 years ago, I think the business community, uh, or what characterized the meetings, was just the presence of business leaders and politicians. And all the other stakeholders would have been seen as some kind of disturbing factors. The fact that we had a real multi-stakeholder composition of the participants. I think this is something which would not have been thinkable 10 years ago. And also in this respect, the terms which we used like um, global citizenship, corporate citizenship, uh, public-private partnerships, social entrepreneurship, they all didn't exist 10 years ago. And I think this is a very remarkable progress uh, which has been made. Now, when I was sitting here and I was listening, of course I was thinking what should be the theme of the next annual meeting because we don't want just to repeat. Of course we will update uh, everybody about the situation. And then I had the idea, I just use one word as the theme for the next annual meeting, listening to you. And so the theme would be how. How do we do it? I mean, everything which has been mentioned. And here, of course, the question comes up, where will we meet next year? And I cannot tell you yet exactly when and where, but I can tell you what country we will be in. And I think it will be very appropriate next year with uh, Brazil mentioned so m many times, and we see election uh, taking place in Brazil to be in Brazil about 100 days after the new president has taken office. I know it doesn't correspond to our usual principle to pay tribute to as many countries as possible, but I think this merits an exception next year with the weight which Brazil has for the whole uh, region. So,
We will announce, we will announce the date and uh, the exact place in a few weeks. I would like to use this opportunity to thank Emilio Losoya Austin, whom you all know, uh, who has been in charge of this meeting. Um, I want to thank him. I want to thank him, his team. And I also want to, to thank him for his uh, loyal um, cooperation with the forum. Um, he has been one of our global leaders for tomorrow. Uh, well, I'm sorry, one of our global leadership fellows, uh, a program which we have instituted to provide young, exceptional people with extraordinary career opportunities. First inside the forum and afterwards outside the forum. Now he is going outside looking for a career more in the private business community. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you his successor. It's um, Marisol Agueta de Barriles, who was a former uh, foreign minister of El Salvador, who has business and political experience. And I can tell you, she brings a lot of passion for this region to the forum. So, And it facilitates my work instead of summarizing for the last, let's say, just taking three or five minutes, um, I leave this job being a good delegator to her. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Schwab, for the opportunity of joining this wonderful and prestigious organization. This is another proof of your commitment to increase the participation of women at the World Economic Forum. This fifth regional meeting has been another demonstration of the outstanding leadership and hard work of my predecessor, Emilio Lozoya Austin, and the Latin American team. Under the wise guidance of the founder of the forum, Professor Klaus Schwab. As a newcomer to the forum, I must mention how impressed I am by the high quality of the people and overall very impressed by the outstanding teamwork by everybody in the forum. I must thank the wonderful job that has been done by our translators. I please ask for recognition for them. And I must also recognize and thank Colombia for allowing us to show the world through their window, uh, through the window of the World Economic Forum of what you have uh, achieved, and especially your leadership and the performance of President Alvaro Uribe, of Minister Plata, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Pro-Export through its chairman, Maria Elvira Pombo, and all of the work team that has made this meeting possible, and each and every Colombian who have exposed us to the risk of wanting to stay. Meeting all the expectations and challenges that lie ahead. I, uh, with the best of my capacity and with the passion for Latin America, I'm sure that together with all of you, we will be able to work on that how. The discussions and outcome are, of this meeting are invaluable and confirm the importance of continuing to foster this profound and open dialogue among the multi-stakeholders from business, government, and the civil society, as we're not only discussing the regional priorities and the most important global trends, but also as we participate actively in the construction of the agenda for, the, for Latin America. I'm sure we're all left with a very optimistic perspective of our region. And I thank all the participants and invite you to continue engaged with us and to reflect 
on Latin America's three critical imperatives where a wide participation is needed. First, to accelerate economic growth, to tackle the risks like corruption, polarization, and violence, and to become more competitive. Second, to improve the way we live and to earn that common trust agenda. Third, to take the responsibility and the opportunity to leverage the global sustainability agenda, shaping it and benefiting from it. I remain at your disposal as head of Latin America to construct with you the roads for that dream that one of the global change makers mentioned of building a Latin America 2.0. Molto obrigada. believe that being pragmatic, it is impossible to believe that we are going to make a common ground of all Latin America. We have spent a lot of time showing the differences of different areas of Latin America, but certainly we have to attempt and we have to dream of a major integration from what we have today. We have to progress in the process of integrating the region, but not dreaming that we are going to have the Latin American common market from uh, the next day. Thank you. Luis Fernando. Yes, uh, I agree that we are running a marathon uh, with a backpack, uh, plenty of stones. And as the countries and the companies are moving, we can release the stones and we'll be lighter and with better conditions to win the marathon. And I, I made a lot of examples of problems that we still ha are ha pending. The other issue related to agriculture, I believe that we have uh, real competitiveness, Latin American countries to produce food and a lot of products, including bioenergy. And maybe we should focus right now in the good examples, the well-succeeded practices that we can replicate. I know that Colombia is doing that, Brazil is looking that, we are using uh, for pasture uh, varieties that came from Africa and were improved in Brazil. We can deliver back to Africa or to other countries of Latin America in order to increase productivity for cattle farming and many other areas that maybe we cannot talk to each other and say what is doing well in your country that we could replicate, and then we can talk about common policies and so on, because today is a lot of asymmetry in the, in the competitiveness of the region. Thank you. Luis Fernando. On this issue of the complacency, I fully agree with uh, what has been mentioned, in, and I mentioned this in some of my comments. Unfortunately, with this matter of the symbol of the marathon, uh, Fernando, we go out to the marathon, but last the night before we uh, made merry, we smoked, we had a lot of drinks, so we simply cannot uh, meet our task. Uh, this is why we're a little slow, we're not doing things properly, and within the region there are some people that are doing it better, and this of course is noticeable, but I think that this discipline and on part of our governments, we have to acquire that. Regarding integration, my recommendation is not be maximalistic, not make the great model of integration. We must go step by step. We have learned this in a very specific and pragmatic issue, which is electric integration. Undoubtedly, there we are leaving on the table a lot of money but we know that we cannot have a great uh, energy integration uh, model there, are difference, uh, political differences and that other nature. Better to go step by step, finding opportunities, developing these, and these opportunities in turn will provide more ambitious schemes. Thank you. There's a trilogy to think large, think small, and but go quickly. This is what my colleague said. Thank you to join me in thanking our uh, co-chairs of the meeting. Uh, 
and bring back um, and bring the, the session to a close, however, I want to invite Professor Klaus Schwab, the founder of the World Economic Forum, to some final words. What they are talking, where they are coming here, I want you to please join me in thanking the four. <laughs> Thank you, Moises, and first I would like to thank you and particularly the co-chairs for the very active involvement and engagement into the discussions over the last 48 hours. I was uh, thinking what has changed because uh, my first Latin American meeting was in 76. Um, now, let me just make one remark. Uh, you, um, Luis, you said we need more young global leaders and so on. But 10 years ago, I think the business community, uh, or what characterized the meetings, was just the presence of business leaders and politicians. And all the other stakeholders would have been seen as some kind of disturbing factors. The fact that we had a real multi-stakeholder composition of the participants. I think this is something which would not have been thinkable 10 years ago. And also in this respect, the terms which we used like um, global citizenship, corporate citizenship, uh, public-private partnerships, social entrepreneurship, they all didn't exist 10 years ago. And I think this is a very remarkable progress uh, which has been made. Now, when I was sitting here and I was listening, of course I was thinking what should be the theme of the next annual meeting because we don't want just to repeat. Of course we will update uh, everybody about the situation. And then I had the idea, I just use one word as the theme for the next annual meeting, listening to you. And so the theme would be how. How do we do it? I mean, everything which has been mentioned. And here, of course, the question comes up, where will we meet next year? And I cannot tell you yet exactly when and where, but I can tell you what country we will be in. And I think it will be very appropriate next year with uh, Brazil mentioned so m many times, and we see election uh, taking place in Brazil to be in Brazil about 100 days after the new president has taken office. I know it doesn't correspond to our usual principle to pay tribute to as many countries as possible, but I think this merits an exception next year with the weight which Brazil has for the whole uh, region. So, We will, announce, we will announce the date and uh, the exact place in a few weeks. I would like to use this opportunity to thank Emilio Losoya Austin, whom you all know, uh, who has been in charge of this meeting. Um, I want to thank him. I want to thank him, his team. And I also want to, to thank him for his uh, loyal um, cooperation with the Forum. Um, he has been one of our global leaders for tomorrow. Uh, well, I'm sorry, one of our global leadership fellows, uh, a program which we have instituted to provide young, exceptional people with extraordinary career opportunities, first inside the forum and afterwards outside the forum. Now he is going outside looking for a career more in the private business community. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you his successor. It's um, Marisol Agueta de Barriles, who was a former uh, foreign minister of El Salvador, who has business and political experience and I can tell you, she brings a lot of passion for this region to the forum.
so. And, and it facilitates my work instead of summarizing for the last, let's say, just taking three or five minutes, um, I leave this job being a good delegator to her. Thank you, Professor Schwab, for the opportunity of joining this wonderful and prestigious organization. This is another proof of your commitment to increase the participation of women at the World Economic Forum. This fifth regional meeting has been another demonstration of the outstanding leadership and hard work of my predecessor, Emilio Lozoya Austin, and the Latin American team. Under the wise guidance of the founder of the forum, Professor Klaus Schwab. As a newcomer to the forum, I must mention how impressed I am by the high quality of the people and overall very impressed by the outstanding teamwork by everybody in the forum. I must thank the wonderful job that has been done by our translators. I please ask for recognition for them. And I must also recognize and thank Colombia for allowing us to show the world through their window, uh, through the window of the World Economic Forum of what you have uh, achieved, and especially your leadership and the performance of President Alvaro Uribe, of Minister Plata, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Pro-Export through its chairman, Maria Elvira Pombo, and all of the work team that has made this meeting possible, and each and every Colombian who have exposed us to the risk of wanting to stay. Meeting all the expectations and challenges that lie ahead. I, uh, with the best of my capacity and with the passion for Latin America, I'm sure that together with all of you, we will be able to work on that how. The discussions and outcome are, of this meeting are invaluable and confirm the importance of continuing to foster this profound and open dialogue among the multi-stakeholders from business, government, and the civil society, as we're not only discussing the regional priorities and the most important global trends, but also as we participate actively in the construction of the agenda for, the, for Latin America. I'm sure we're all left with a very optimistic perspective of our region. And I thank all the participants and invite you to continue engaged with us and to reflect on Latin America's three critical imperatives where a wide participation is needed. First, to accelerate economic growth, to tackle the risks like corruption, polarization and violence, and to become more competitive. Second, to improve the way we live and to earn that common trust agenda. Third, to take the responsibility and the opportunity to leverage the global sustainability agenda, shaping it and benefiting from it. I remain at your disposal as head of Latin America to construct with you the roads for that dream that one of the global change makers mentioned of building a Latin America 2.0. Molto obrigada. <laughs>